Yes, sir. Yes, sir. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, AIOS Namrata Ma'am for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Basu, for wonderful moderation. And it's indeed a pleasure uh, to present to you some nuggets on viral anterior uveitis. So at the outset, we all know, when do you suspect viral anterior uveitis in a patient? So a typical patient would be one who has an acute presentation, has a unilateral disease, has painful eye, and the patient could be of any age group, either gender. And two most important signs that we know are elevated intraocular pressure and iris signs such as atrophy and sectoral defects. Now the first step when you suspect a viral anterior uveitis would be to identify the phenotype. And by this, I'm going to show you three classical scenarios where you have viral anterior uveitis in a patient. The first one is the most common, which is acute granulomatous uveitis, in which you have a patient who is about 45 years old, has some decrease in the vision, like 624 in this particular case. You have a very high pressure in the 40s and you have usually a unilateral involvement. And you see that there is a granulomatous anterior uveitis. The second presentation is that of a relatively white eye, a young patient, let's say a 25 year old male who has few keratic precipitates and almost very negligible cells and mild flare, but they have very high intraocular pressure of 50 or even more, and they have corneal edema and inflammation. And these are patients who we classically call them as the poshner schlossmann syndrome. And finally, we have the third phenotype, which is the Fuchs uveitis syndrome, also called as the Fuchs heterochromic uveitis, in which you have a middle-aged patient with fine stellate KPs, and you have posterior subcapsular cataract. And more, more often than we uh, really know that they, these patients have a lot of vitritis. And because of the development of a posterior subcapsular cataract, they have a decrease in visual acuity to 624, and almost 50% of these patients have glaucoma. The next most important step in viral anterior uveitis is to exclude this, these patients of Fuchs, because patients of Fuchs uveitis essentially do not require any treatment, apart from treatment for complications such as cataract and glaucoma. And within the second step, the most important aspect is to get an aqueous polymerase chain reaction so that we understand the etiology of the virus. So how do you exclude Fuchs? This is important because Fuchs is very commonly seen uh, in young individuals who are 20 to 40 years of age. And of course, most, the, most of these patients are unilateral and bilateral cases, which are rare, can present with a diagnostic dilemma. These patients have a mild IOP elevation and a white eye and these patients classically do not show posterior sinicae. They have fine white stellate KPs, which may be diffuse, and there is iris stromal atrophy, and these patients can have iris heterochromia. It's important to exclude these patients of Fuchs because these patients will not require any form of therapy, including anti-inflammatory therapy. Now, more than 50% patients of Fuchs, and this is very important when we have a patient, and this was discussed in some of the talks before, that posterior segment examination is very important. But remember, 50% patients with Fuchs may have posterior segment lesions, such as toxoplasmosis-like scars, or non-specific scars, such as histoplasmosis-like scars. Let me show you this patient who is a young female, a 32-year-old female, who has the only complaint was unilateral floaters. And this patient has occasional cells, mild inflammation. And as you can see, there is a small retinal lesion just above the disc. Now this patient has been seen elsewhere and has been investigated with a fluorescein angiography and ICG. And all you see on the imaging is just a scar which is showing an increasing hyperfluorescence. Now this patient went on to receive immunosuppression for more than a year and was on steroids, developed secondary glaucoma and remember, all this is just for a simple complaint of floaters. And this patient was essentially diagnosed with Fuchs uveitis and required no therapy. Some of these patients come to us with uh, complaints of persistent floaters, and they say that you need to do something for my floater. So one of the options for these patients is doing a floaterectomy, but the patient has to understand the, uh, the underlying risks of a surgical intervention. 
And when you have severe uh, floaters and vitritis, these patients may benefit with floaterectomy. And we've done, in our experience, uh, six size of six patients, and this is in PGI data. Uh, and these are patients that I operated. And these patients had unilateral involvement. And we used very minimal 27 gauge vitrectomy. And what was very interesting is that in the literature, we know that Fuchs is associated very strongly with rubella. But we had two patients who had cytomegalovirus uh, PCR positive, and these patients ultimately ended up with treatment. So these are some new things that we are learning in Fuchs uveitis, and we definitely don't have a large series on this so far, but this is an area which is, I'm sure, will evolve in the times to come with an increased use of diagnostic vitrectomy. So in remember, in Singapore and China and Japan, Fuchs has been shown to be probably CMV related by a soon fake cheese group. And this is something that we must keep at the back of our minds. Now coming to the most important etiologies that is HSV, VZV, CMV and rubella. And we are of course going to discuss the first top three because these are the most important ones that come to our clinic. And the most important is to identify which type of herpes virus we're dealing with, whether it's a simplex, varicella zoster or a cytomegalovirus. The classic signs of HSV anterior uveitis are, it's a young patient, either gender, younger age, fourth or fifth decade compared to varicella. And it's unilateral in most cases. And remember, some of these patients may have a hypopion. So hypopion uveitis is possible in viral anterior uveitis. And remember that vitritis is seen in about 43% patients. Now, when I'll come to a varicella, we'll find that the vitritis is seen in much more uh, patients as compared to HSV. These patients have medium-sized KP cells and flare, and this is a typical examination. And for uh, residents and fellows in uveitis, remember to do the corneal examination because you may have corneal scars or edema in 50% patients. And a lot of these patients have dull corneal sensations. So in addition to the pressure, you must look at the corneal features. These patients have pigmented keratic precipitates, which may be an important feature of HSV acute anterior uveitis. As I said, 70 to 80% eyes may show these keratic precipitates in HSV, and you must dilate and see the fundus for any associated acute retinal necrosis, which may coexist in these patients. The iris involvement usually is sectoral. You have patchy stromal iris atrophy. Diffuse atrophy is less common. It's more common in varicella, and these patients may have endotheliitis. These are some of the uh, images that we've obtained using uh, fluorescein angiography of the anterior segment, but of course, these are not standard of care. So re-emphasizing HSV, it's an acute presentation, it's never chronic, unilateral, young patients, pigmented KPs, and involvement of the iris. Varicella is different, more severe, more older patients. So you have six, seven decade of life, the involvement, and unilaterality is generally more than 95%. And most of these patients will have vitritis and profound corneal sensation loss. Even the inflammation, as you see in this clinical picture, is so severe compared to the simplex virus. And you have a lot of edema, iris atrophy and vitritis and diffuse iris atrophy is common. So to compare, anterior inflammation is more common in HSV and vitreous inflammation is more common in VZV. Cytomegalovirus is important because it follows, it's a, it belongs to herpes family, but has a different phenotype because it may have even a chronic presentation. These patients typically have very high intraocular pressure, more than 45, and no posterior sinicae, no vitritis, and intact corneal sensations. So number of differences from HSV and VZV. These patients can result in secondary glaucoma, and in children, these patients who have glaucoma may show a reversal of glaucomatis changes if these patients are treated on time. Corneal examination is important to look for the nodular corneal lesions called as coin-shaped lesions who have a very high positive predictive value for this condition. Remember in viral uveitis, if you do a PCR and you get a negative test, it does not rule out viral infection. So it could be because simply because you have a low viral load or you have a low sample or you have certain inhibitory compounds which are there in the sample. False positive is possible, but it's very, very uncommon. And the best time to do a PCR is when the pressure is high, inflammation is high, and no antivirals have been given. You have other imaging tools and we'll 
just list them but not go into the details now the therapies for uh, the viral anterior uveitis typically for hsv will have the oral acyclovir 400 mg five times a day or val acyclovir is preferred because of its lower dosing and typically given for four to six weeks with steroids and cycloplegics maintenance will be done by 400 mg twice a day or val acyclovir 500 mg twice a day how long nobody knows the simplest answer is several years to prevent relapse VZV uveitis and severe VZV we give full dose that is 800 mg 5 times a day of acyclovir and val acyclovir 1 g 3 times a day again at least 4 to 6 weeks initially and then you taper if you have cmv retinitis it's the most difficult condition to manage because these patients require long term val gan cyclovir therapy and typically 900 mg twice a day followed by a taper and uh, topical gancyclovir gel works very well in these patients in anterior uveitis you can also use them in herpes simplex or varicella chronic cmv is seen in more than 80% patients developing a chronic disease with re re relapses and a quantitative pcr is useful to determine if the viral load is high or low if the low viral load is present you can simply manage with topical gels but if you have a high viral load in a relapse then these patients have to be treated like an acute episode using systemic therapy unless uh, until the pcr is negative thank you very much and with this i'll be happy to take any questions